So good morning. Today we are continuing this deep dive into the five levels of the soul, but I am ready to add another component to it. And that is, today we're going to talk about integrating all levels of beingness, the integration. So let me try to explain this the best I can. The soul wave, let's think of a soul wave, right? Like a sound wave. Let's think of a soul wave. The soul wave that we operate on is in accordance to the way we choose to live our life. The way we choose to live our life, that will be the way that our soul wave like a sound wave, operates on. Generally speaking, we ascend from, from one rung to the next, expanding and climbing further. You see, when we talk in Kabbalistic terms, we're going to talk about ascending and descending, kind of like Jacob's Ladder, kind of like the idea. But if you remember when we spoke about the Sephirot, we spoke about the I, God's interaction with this world. We said it's like kind of like a spiral. So it's ascending and descending, but in a spiral. But occasionally, occasionally our lives don't follow the strict order of the spiral, of the ascending and descending. And we have the ability to quantum leap and skip levels only to fall back to the earlier developmental stages afterwards. So we can live for moments on the level of Yechida and later we can plunge back into the realm of Nefesh. We can live from the level of Chaya, and then return to a strictly vegetative level of awareness. So we're kind of kind of sprung back and forth between the different levels of our soul. Fundamentally, it's our choice. It's our free choice, whether we live from the place of the surface self, the less sparkling levels of the soul, or from the higher, more expansive and, and brilliant levels of the soul. By our very nature, by nature, we are essentially hybrids. We are admixtures, of various aspects ranging from the more sublime, from the more transcendental, to the more physical, to the more bodily, to the more mundane. A, a genuine sense of wholeness, a genuine sense of integration can be achieved when there is a connection, when there is a cohesion, when there's a uniformity between all of the different aspects that comprise our beingness. So us, you and me, having been given a body, we are obliged morally to our bodies and spiritually to our deeper selves. We take care of, hopefully, we take care of our physical, we take care of our mental, our emotional health. We want to see that they all work in unison with the innermost purpose of our being, of existence. We want to make sure that 
things are working in order on a physical level, hopefully on an emotional level, and on a spiritual level as well. But it doesn't always happen that way. We can often jump from one stage to another. Some of us will be in a good mood and then all of a sudden in a bad mood. And it happens like that. Some of us less so. Some of us it's a gradient. Some of us wake up, as my grandmother used to say, on the wrong side of the bed. Whatever that means. And so to start talking about our lives in a linear way, like there's five levels of our soul, we have to realize that even though there are five levels of the soul, they're, they're categories almost, because we're constantly jumping from one to the other and back and forth. I'll give you uh, an, an, an analogy, an example. Not an analogy, an example. For two and a half years, the, the celebrated Talmudic sages from the house of Shammai and the house of Hillel debated and weighed an existential question. Now, these were two great schools of thought. For those of you who are, who are taking my Talmud class, you have, you have become aware and knowledgeable of these two schools, the school of Beis Shammai and the school of Beis Hillel. And the question that this school, these two schools debated for two and a half years was basically to be or not to be. But they didn't, they didn't phrase it that way. The way they phrased it was, was it better for the human to have been created or not to have been created? That was the question. Was it better for the human to have been created or for the human not to have been created? Now, I would open up the, the floor, but we don't have the context that, at least in this class, we don't. There is context in the Talmud, but we don't have the context of the, of the debate. But I want to give you the, the basis of the question. And instead of going through the debate, I want to give you the conclusion of a two and a half year debate. What they said was, <clears throat> and you can find this in the pages of the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud on Erevin 13b. I looked at it this morning. It's a fascinating debate. Their conclusion was that it would have been better for humanity not to have been created. But now that we've been created, <clears throat> sorry, now that we've been created, let us reflect carefully upon our actions. I'll say that again for you. They said it would have been better. So the question was again, should we have been created or not created? Their conclusion is, it would have been better had we not been created. But now, we are the result of that choice. The choice of creation. So we can't choose today whether to be created or not. We've been created. Both on a general, on a more general level, and on a specific level, we've been created. So now that we've been created... It's our responsibility to reflect carefully in our actions. As conscious creations, we have to reflect upon and differentiate the good, the benevolent, the constructive from the opposite. And then to contemplate the qualitative nature of the good actions themselves. That's essentially what they're saying. Shall you have a question? I do. <clears throat> I don't know that much about Shammai and Hillel, although a rabbi in Chicago did a whole you know, lecture on the theories of thought. 
Number one, I find it hard to believe that somebody would ask that question, should we or shouldn't we have been created, when obviously it was God's plan, and these were both men of significant faith in God and God's choices. Why would they debate that question after the fact? So it's a good question you're asking. And I think that if I can lead into your question a bit, one of the issues that we have in our society is that a lot of our views on religion and spirituality don't come from Judaism. Judaism is not about blind faith. I think that we've already established that for quite a while in our class. We believe in God, but it's a speck of belief. And afterwards, everything is debatable. So what they're doing is they're not saying God doesn't exist. They're not saying creation doesn't happen. They're not questioning faith. What they're doing is questioning the existence, who we are, trying to find what we say in Hebrew, our tafkid, trying to find our purpose in this world. So they're not, see, there's different there's there's lots of different types of questions. There are some people who question because they're just, as we say, S-H-I-T disturbers. There are some people who question because they like the rain exercise of questioning. There are some rhetorical questions. People question, they don't even want an answer. There are directed questions. Questions that people will direct you and they, they know the answer you're going to give them. It's kind of like, it's, 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 I would say it's a manipulative question because they know what you're going to say. Not even rhetorical. It's, it's worse than rhetorical. The kind of questioning, and it's something we haven't really dug deep enough in, in our classes, the kind of questioning that Judaism has is open questioning, which means we're going to start with a particular premise. The rabbis aren't questioning whether or not God exists. They're trying to understand, as physical beings, the existence of the cosmos, the existence of God. They're not just accepting blind faith. Now that they accepted that God exists, they want to understand God. So this is the process of Beis Hillel and Beis Shammai understanding God. And through the perspective of understanding God in our world and through our lens. I hope that clarifies it. Okay. To be continued. Another question came in. Is the Hillel Shammai debate paralleling the angels? Are they repeating the angels' wish for us not to be created or something else? It's an interesting question. There are various Tal Talmudic uh, debates that the angels had um it, it depends I, I i couldn't qualify that question without properly giving a, a a background on those debates that the angels had so it's a great question it's way too advanced for 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 this class because i would i would have to give a lot of background to be able to answer that but you're definitely for those of you who know some of those debates and the Talmudic debates and the Kabbalistic debates, you're on the right path there. there. There's definitely something there, but you have to be careful because to make sure that those that you're paralleling it with the right debates. Another question: When you say purpose, are you talking about a meaningful life? Um, the, the words in English are funny. You know, I think that it, the way I look at meaningful life is that, like, well, I was created and I'm here in this world, so I might as well make the best of it, whatever. That's not what purpose is. According to Judaism, purpose is that before you came into the world, your soul was given a specific purpose. God said, you, soul of Marianne, soul of Cheryl, 
soul of Jill. Those are the three of you that I can see right now. The world needs you. The world needs your talents. The world needs your abilities. There is something unique that only your soul can accomplish. So according to Judaism, our purpose predates our existence. And the reason why we are brought into this world, which Kabbalah calls the world of falsehood, is to be able to fulfill that purpose. So it's not that I'm here, let me make the best of it. It's that my I was brought into this world to fulfill a particular purpose. Okay, let's move on. Now, going back to this debate of Hillel and Shammai as to whether or not we should have been created. On the surface, it appears that both schools are in favor of an approach to life that is free of attachment. What does that mean practically? It means practically that it's better to disengage from physicality than to become involved. We need to be, to be only as much as we are forced to. Now, in this paradigm, detachment would be the most appropriate approach to life. But this is not consistent with either of these rabbis' worldview. If you take a deeper look at the argument, and look at I was looking at some of the commentaries today on the argument. If you take a deeper look at the, the argument, if you look at the wording of the argument, what they're really arguing is that such a detached approach to life was never their intention. So while the colloquial way to translate this passage of Talmud is whether it is better to be or not to be, the word they actually use in Aramaic is noach. N-O-A-C-H, noach, which means ease. As in an easier or more comfortable or less strenuous. So clearly, if you take a look at the words, and by the way, the Talmudists are the greatest wordsmiths. And so we learn how to be very specific about the words that we use. So if you take a look at the word and you start seeing it from this idea of ease, so their dispute is not about what is better, but rather about what would be easier and less exhausting for us. And so what is their summation? The summation is, it would have been easier for the soul not to descend in order to inhabit the body easier. But they all agree that as far as purpose, as far as life design goes, the objective is to integrate all elements of self, the physical, the emotional, the mental, the spiritual, to integrate all of them. And to live a one-dimensional and one-sided life can be easier. Because a one-dimensional life has less difficulty. There's far less challenges. But that's not where the ultimate existential intention of life lies. It would be so much easier to have blind faith. The problem is we're thinking people. We can't have blind faith. 
It would be so much easier to just be a child for our entire life and not to have to go through the challenges of adulthood. But we're not children for our whole life. So to ask an adult to have a childlike experience, what we're doing is we're not allowing them to achieve their potential. At some point in life, we have to grow up. And I don't even mean grow up. I mean, I, we, we can have the childlike uh, enthusiasm and attitude of a Cheryl. We don't have to grow up that way. But we need to grow up in a way to understand that there's more to life than just the surface level. So an attitude, yes, we can be fun and playful and, and, and excited and exuberant. But then when it comes to purpose and what we're doing here, we need to have an adult experience. We can't just be satisfied with a childlike experience. Does that make sense? Yes, very much. Questions? I think it could also be really challenging you know, we will we'll use that childlike or not grown up when you can kind of see it, like you could see it or feel it or know it's over there, but you haven't figured out how to get there. Mm. So while there might be this ease in, in not going there, in my experience, knowing that there's something, you know, that fifth level as is can be really painful to to not at least strive to get there so I, I think it's a great great example but imagine you didn't know the fifth level and i and there's a lot of people that i encounter that don't know and it's it's challenging to like cheryl said it's to have conversations or interact on any meaningful deep meaningful way is challenging and not that we're supposed to with everybody. But yeah, if we didn't know, what would that be? I guess I don't really have a question. I was just really No, but really, Joe, what you're saying is, is an important is an important element. And that is is that there are people who choose not to know because choose, yes. we have access to information. Look at how we're all here. I mean, we live in a time that is the most amazing time with access to information at our fingertips in a way that our parents didn't even dream of. So today, living in the world today, anyone who doesn't know, I believe it's a choice. Well, and I started to cut you, Cheryl. It, it kind of makes me think of, you know, in medicine, in our modern Western medicine, you know, these views, the things we know now, even 50 years ago, the people that surmise or thought that there was another way to do things, another way to approach an illness, another way to see the body were, you know, uh, not accepted, if not even worse. I mean, the Galileos, you know, exactly. So I, I think it's, it's a similar thing. Yeah. We don't necessarily have proof in the way we can measure, you know, and acupuncture wasn't, accepted for years because you couldn't measure it with the same gold standard as surgery or some other medicine. We now have techniques. Now we understand it a little bit better. So it, it just it feels like it's all the same as to. In, in, in Russian, there's a, a euphemism that is used. The reason why I know it is because the Rebbe uses it a lot. It's called a Sam Sapoznik. Uh, from what I understand, it, it, it means a, a simple shoemaker, but it refers to someone who doesn't want to allow change, who wants everything to be the way it's always been. Yeah. And I think that we live in an amazing time. We have access to medicine. We have access to information. We have access to ideas. We have time we're not worried where our next meal is coming from. We have time to sit here on a Thursday morning enjoying this kind of intellectual conversation. Right. 
we, we have so much we have privilege that that our grandparents could only have imagined wouldn't even have imagined possible they, they they were you know if, when I think about some of the some of the writings and and the teachings that I learn, Maimonides and and the Talmud, these great scholars they didn't have libraries of books. Maimonides didn't have a library. He had maybe one or two books, if he was lucky. He was he created some of the most amazing magnum opus of 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 of, of thought and 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 philosophy and. And and codifying Jewish law without any information, he had no access. He didn't have Google. <laughs> yeah. Cheryl, please. I want, I want to piggyback on on what Jill said in terms of having the intellectual conversations and Rabbi, what you said about having choice. So I live in a world in Florida now, not Chicago so much where people are on the golf course, people are playing tennis, they're busy planning their next social event, they're busy dinner, families, whatever it is. But like you said, Rabbi, the thing is, they can change and get into that spiral, spiritual or emotional thought. They choose not to because it's easier to stay in their little world and their little life of golf and tennis and social events. We have access to that. I have access to that. I choose to be here because I do want to grow and learn more. I can't have, like I said before, I can't have these conversations with too many people. So that's the sad thing. Yeah. But thank God you have people that you can have those conversations with and yeah. that you are motivated to do this yourself is also a beautiful inspiration. And I have to go back to something else that you said when our levels are more integrated from a personal standpoint, I live with chronic pain all the time. It's just something that I have when I get in that spiritual mode or meditation or whatever that next level is, it does release something. I don't know if it's cortisol, but I can get calmer and feel better physically. Mm. So when I sit in this class, yeah, I have a pillow behind me in my back, but I feel rather pain-free. It's like as soon as I get up, it all goes away. It's like you're in a different dimension. Yes. And I want to be in that higher dimension, <laughs> like more. Okay. Thank you. And bless you for this class. Really. It's, it's been life changing for me. Thank you. I need those accolades. I feel like I don't get enough accolade in my life. So thank you for the accolade. <laughs> I used to be very, uh, very, you know, somehow shy to it, but I realize, you know, growing up, sorry that I'm going off on a tangent here, but growing up, if, if you said thank you to someone, they would say in Yiddish, nishta kein farvas, nothing to think. And that was just the 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 world that that I was used to. Um, with, you know, a lot of the people who I respected, uh, my teachers, you know, this is what they would say. And so I got used to that. And what and 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 as I've had the ability to think about it, I, I they're they're destroying the thank you. Thank you is a very powerful thing. It's it's a it's a way that we can find uh, emotional connection. What do you mean there's nothing to think? Why did you say thank you if there's nothing to think? Why are you saying, why are you destroying my thank you? And so I I have to retrain myself to be able to accept that that that, uh, that thank you. So it's it's been a process, but uh, I appreciate it. It means a lot. Marianne. No, can't hear you. Unmute. Marianne, you have to unmute. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I don't speak very much. I'm used to the mute. Uh, I think that we could speak about gratitude. Mm -hmm. More just to... Yeah. This is what we need more. Yeah. But it's interesting because gratitude needs a and, and everything in life 
this is very Kabbalistic here. It needs a giver and a receiver. Why? One of the great debates, another great debate in the Talmud is which is more important, the giver or the receiver? Both. Because without the receiver, the giver can't give. And without the giver, the receiver can't receive. And that there's a mutual relationship there between the giver and the receiver. It's very powerful. You know, and then you start moving that conversation into what's more important, the the philanthropist or the person the philanthropist is giving to. Well, you can't be a philanthropist if nobody needs anything. And the person who's in need has to live a very difficult life in order for the philanthropist to be a philanthropist. I'm just giving you just kind of like an inkling into some of these very, very complicated Talmudic uh, debates. But yes, gratitude, Marianne, is a great, great conversation. And I, I think at one point when we finish this uh, this deep dive, we should do a deep dive on these kinds of emotional states. Gratitude, um, the, the the philanthropist versus the receiver. All these are, these are amazing, amazing conversations that we can have. Let's... Uh, Let's continue. So the Torah, the Torah comes to codify an integrated lifestyle, aligning the human with the being, aligning the human with the being coordinating what would normally appear as divergent energies so that we can harmonize our conflicted nature and act from a place of integrity and a place of wholeness. The Torah doesn't teach the denial or the sacrifice of the animal aspect within. What it does teach is a quest to meld the animal with the divine or the animal with the angelic so that each can serve the other in the greater context of growth, in the greater context and expansion of consciousness, of gratitude, of compassion. Spiritual immaturity is what I'm going to call those people who choose not to look beyond the surface. Spiritual immaturity expresses itself through the soul's yearning for exclusive transcendence, to function on its own terms while ignoring its mission to fuse the divergent energies of self. As maturity rises, we come to the realization in Kabbalah that the body is not a jailhouse for the soul. The body is not a jailhouse for the soul. It's such an important idea. And the soul, a contradiction to what the lower elements of the self desire. Once the soul becomes properly acclimated to the realities of the body, it wishes not to fight it. But the soul can then recognize that together they make a good and dynamic partnership. The natural transcendence of the soul becomes an all-inclusive and gives focus 
to the needs of the body. While the body offers the more, the more rarefied parts of the self, the opportunity <clears throat> to experience the finite, the opportunity to experience finitude. And ultimately, ultimately, they both benefit. So much that when it comes time for the soul to journey away from this world, when it comes time for the soul to journey onwards, the soul doesn't want to leave. It actually doesn't want to leave its best friend, the body. That's how close they become. The sages say in Ethics of Our Fathers, in Pirkei Avot, against your will you are born and against your will you will die. Think about that a second. Against your will you are born and against your will you will die. It seems like a contradictory statement. If it's against your will to be born, that means that a person's soul would rather not be alive. So why is it saying that against your will you will die? Here's the deeper meaning. And this is what I want to end off with today. Before a soul descends into this world, the soul observes the temptations, the challenges of this world. And it doesn't wish to enter the body, as it were. But then the soul jumps into the pool. It's like someone learning how to swim. You're standing on the side of the pool and you're just thinking about all the challenges. But then the soul comes to live within the body. And it realizes the amazing abilities, the amazing opportunities the body and the physical world presented with, including the wonderful transformations that can only occur while alive within a body. And so the ethics of our fathers say, Against your will, you will die because the soul wishes to remain within the body for as long as it can. So now take a look at that question from the Talmud. Now take a look at that question. Was it better for us to have been created or not? Well, from the side of the pool, obviously not because of the challenges, because of the difficulties. But once we jump in, there's nothing like a good swim. Once we jump in, we can see how much we're able to accomplish. We can see the effect and the good that our soul can have over the corporeal, over the material, over this world. And as a result of that, we don't want to leave. As a result of that, sorry, as a result of that, we want to stay here forever. Can I ask a question about sure. that? Is that because when the soul hasn't descended yet, it doesn't really have access to the lower levels of the soul? So the physical and the emotional, the things that you only know when you experience it in this body. And you're exactly. like, some of that's pretty cool. Like, you know. Exactly. The, the, the lower levels of the soul, they're only, they're, 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 they're deep in the water. They're only yeah. theoretical to the soul while it's not in the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanted I to just question. give you, yes, please. 
Can you talk more about spiritual immaturity? What does that look like? So there's different levels of spiritual maturity. The, the level that we're referring to today is people choosing not to explore their spiritual self. There's a, just like there's a body and the body needs food, there's a soul and the soul needs food. There's a lot of people who starve their soul because at the end of the day, if you starve your body, you won't live in this world. But if you if you starve your soul, you'll live in this world, but you're going to live a shell of an existence. You may be depressed. You may be emotionally unstable, mentally unstable. And look, we're, we're going through a mental health crisis in our world today. And so I believe, if I can be so bold to say this, that a lot of people have starved their soul for so long they don't realize that their soul is hungry. They've their their beings, their bodies have just gotten used to not having that spiritual. Does that make sense, Susie? Yeah. Any other questions before we uh, move on to our takeaways, our nuggets? Giving you a minute to think of your nuggets. We want I want a good nugget today. Even if you caught one little thing, I know today's class was really deep. I asked you beforehand if it was okay. Can I ask another question? Sure. So right at the beginning, um, you talked about the integration of a few aspects of our soul. So there's the surface soul. What so are the what, other ones? What we're referring to, um, I'm not sure if you had a chance to listen to the previous classes, but what we're referring to is the five levels of the soul. The nefesh, right. the ruach, the neshama, the chai yechida. So that when we're talking about different aspects and we're talking about the different levels of the soul. So today's discussion was the fourth level, yechidas? No, the, the, today's discussion was an integration of all the levels. was showing how was the idea of integrating the body and the soul. But not just integrating the body and the soul, but to, to try to start the process of integrating the body and the five levels of the soul. And as Jill said, sometimes, you know, you want to kind of bring in that highest level of the soul, but it's hard. But we could do it if we don't see our lives in linear way. Like we could have moments, maybe like Cheryl was saying, that she doesn't feel the pain of the body when she's in this class because she's having a moment of yichida. She's having a moment of experiencing a higher level of the soul. So... It doesn't mean nobody, we're physical humans having a physical experience. But we're not just physical. We're, we're, we're spiritual people having a physical experience. So no one's asking us to be spiritual people having a spiritual experience. But what Kabbalah wants us to do is integrate, is be spiritual people having a physical experience, is integrate those parts of the soul. Is, is remember that when you're having physical pain, there's a spiritual source to it. So you can tap into that part of your soul and that may be healing for you. It may not be, but it may be. And it may be another way of looking at health, not just through the lens of the physical, not just through the lens of the emotional or the mental, but also the lens of the spiritual. Well, it's like you said in one of the classes that what Kabbalah is about is we are physical beings, but we bring with Kabbalah, through Kabbalah, we bring spirituality into the physical. That's right. And that's our job, not the opposite way around. It's not to bring physical into the spiritual. It's to infuse this world because we live in this world and our purpose is in this world and our job is in this world, is to bring spirituality into this world. If any time... You know it's right when you're bringing spirituality into this world. If it's trying to take you away from this world, then you know it's wrong. And I think that, I, I said that for, for Chava, because I know that some people who go through different experiences in life, they they have a hard time differentiating 
between a real spiritual experience and a fake spiritual experience. So according to Kabbalah, a real spiritual experience is the ability to bring spirituality into this world. Not, if anything that's wanting you to remove or take yourself away from this world is not a real spiritual experience. Wow. A question. Um, the world to come, following the resurrection of the dead, once it gives the soul the ability to improve the world and it craves upon maturity. Yes, exactly. But that's th that's the realization. That's the final realization. So we're going a step ahead over here. But what we want to talk about today is being in this world and understanding what our tafkid, what our purpose is in this world. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's let's move to our nuggets. We want some good nuggets. Jill, I'm going to start with you today. What's okay. your nuggets? <laughs> you know, in all of our classes, I'm always thinking about how is this in my life? Because I'm not a monk in a cave on a mountain someplace. I'm existing in, in life amongst people that, um, and I'll use the word have to, that I have to be in some kind of relationship with there, you know, and some of those people have no interest, no knowledge, no desire to look below the surface and have the but are interested i'm not even sure how to phrase this in trying to bring me to where they are mm. that is m one of my big challenges um with people that i must interact with and on some level and i've you know got a whole lot of give raw around that <laughs> um but just thinking about this and how I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what my actual nugget is because it all seems. I, I guess my nugget is for me to try not to be so incredibly judgmental <laughs> around their process, because I know it's around that judgmental just kind of keeps coming back to me. Um, and to try to find some kind of peace and kindness to still interact helpfully. So that was a very convoluted nugget, <laughs> I say, but that's that's just what kept coming up for me here. So I'm going to pass it to Chava. Thank you, Jill. Wow, this class it was incredible. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Um, I like the space that we've arrived to. <laughs> uh, I think I have two nuggets. Well, the first one is that we have the capability and the consciousness, if we choose to, to be able to visit these realms of like Yehuda just for moments um, and bring some of that back with us into our experience that's incredible and then the thing you shared about um the was it the ethics of our fathers is that what we were talking about mm -hmm. um i'm really interested in this realm of da'at and the birth canal and what that really means for the soul when it, it's such a tough decision to, to travel through the birth canal and be in this world. Um, so I'm super interested in what that space is like. I'd like to investigate that further. Um, let's see, I don't have my reading glasses on. M Marianne, would you like to give your nugget? Unmute. Thank you, Chava. And thank you, Chava, for the class. So I just, maybe nuggets, uh, I don't know what exactly a nugget here but, uh, is, but I'm going to have two things. First, um, uh, you said against your will, you are born. Against your will, will die. So, I mean, 
uh, it's about death and it's not um, just it's a matter life is so good that I just don't want to die so I really have to uh, to just to understand not to understand uh, to to understand or to feel the meaning of dying I, I know what is it because I've I've been through such experiences with my parents but uh, if life is so good why die so just um, this is my question uh, maybe just this is my first thing uh, as a question I don't want to I don't I don't believe in it in eternal eternal life but the meaning of death you know uh, and my second thing is it's incredible to see just up to a certain point, how the philosophers and writers have been inspired by the Kabbalah. Uh, I mean, talking about um, all the things. For example, when you are uh, when you are about to leave, when you are in the womb, you're just in this idea, in this idea of wonderful life. Ideas, everything is beautiful. But when you when you fall after into this life, some say that it's just it's much more difficult. And the nugget for me is just how wonderful it is. You know, it's not it's not a, a, a it's not a, a a jump into the awful world, but it's a jump into the beautiful world. But I'm always amazed. Just to finish my line, um, just when I read things, and I now that I'm just interested in the old, I mean in the in the Old Testament, in the Bible, and in the Kabbalah, it's incredible to see how many writers, how many people have been written, have been writing about it, and I'm discovering it. I'm discovering it. Sorry, my English is not that good, but those were my my two my two nuggets. Thank you. You want to pass it on? <laughs> yeah, uh, Ilana. Hi. Good morning. Thank you to everybody. Amazing. Um, I really appreciate the fact that you always tell us it's it's our choice how we behave, and you know, I, I I really appreciate the idea that it's fluid. Like we're not always in acting in the highest level of our soul, but we have the potential, and maybe once in a while, it it does work out. And in in terms of um, you know, dying. It's, I find it so interesting because, um, you know, against your will, you will die. And you said, like, life is so good. But even for people where life is not so good, um, you know, people still want to live, you know? And sometimes you're like, you know, why? Like, the quality of life is lousy or whatever. But it's amazing how you know, that human phys physicality um, hangs on people really. And, and other people are, are able to let go uh, in a peaceful way. So I don't know, I always wrestle with that. Um, I'm gonna pass it on to Susie. Thank you. Susie, we can't hear you. Okay, sorry, this time of day, the sun just beams in for a few seconds right through my window. Um, I don't know, there were so many golden nuggets today. I don't know where to start. I'll just give tell you some of my notes. Um, you know, against your will, you are born and against your will, you die. That's really meaty. I have to think about that one for a long time. Um, You know, the other question that you asked is, um, who is more important, the giver or the taker? That's a real conundrum, right? Because both, you can't have one without the other. Um, but it's sad to be a needy person. I don't wish that on anybody, but it, it does give opportunity to people to fulfill that, that mitzvah, you know, not just chop, cop, you know, um, take it off their bucket list, but it, there's an opportunity there. So, anyways, uh, Cheryl? 
Thank you, Susie. I learned so much from everybody's comments as well as this class today. So I have a question and then I have my nugget. And my question is you talked about, I don't know if I'm spelling it right so that I can say it right. Tahid being purpose. Is that what you said, Rabbi? Is it T-A-C-H-I-D? Tough kid. I'll put it in the notes. Tough kid. Tough. So, like like a tough kid. Okay. Tough kid. Thank you. Okay. And I was wondering how I remember very early in this class, I think I had said that I was taking another class years ago about finding my yud. Is that the same thing? Your per is it like a synonymous word? Sort of? okay. Yeah, yud, yud yeah. represents the spark of the soul. So sometimes people say when it comes to purpose, it's a, it's a little bit of an, an elementary way of looking at it, but okay. it is a way that some people use it. Um, but it is yud being the spark of the soul. Okay. Yes. And I'm going to go back. My nugget had to do with something Susie said or brought up again, and it had to do with spiritual immaturity that people don't even know they're deprived of the spiritual element. And that resonated with me. It's one thing not to be able to share with a friend because they're not at that level. It's another to think that they're deprived of that element. And yet they have the potential, as we talked about last week, to look at people as their potential selves and not just what you see or hear. So that kind of tied it together for me. That's my nugget. Who's left today? Uh, Sami? Thank you. What the class today. So, <clears throat> so <clears throat> I, I was actually thinking about this like these days. Uh, but it's, it's, it's amazing how words can mean, can mean stuff. Because like when you say, you your mission in life, if you are on a mission or something, this means that this place is not yours. It's not yours. I mean, and this is exactly what King Solomon said when, when he, I mean, his famous phrase, vanity of vanities. Mm -hmm. so this, this place is not ours. So if we want to find peace ourselves, it's like we must understand that we can we have this place not ours. There is a way if you want to change things, to means vote or something, but do not get attached to it too much. Because like you, you, I mean, it's, it's like you are a, a company hired you and, you and you have a job to do. You cannot change the whole thing. It's, it's, it's not yours. I mean, you have some specific things to do and, uh, and let go. This is how I see it. But this is like a wonderful class. Like, thank you. I think uh, Chava hasn't had a chance. Um, I I did. Okay. Um, and wait, did but I feel like did Julian? Go? Oh, Julian. Oh, he has. Uh, Julian says, I think my takeaway would be, however, much we seem to understand of this stuff. We're always relearning more to it. Even the developmental stage of a baby can teach us a great spiritual truths that we shouldn't downplay or ignore anything. There's always more. God puts his infinite depths into everything, however small or finite it may appear at the surface. Thank you, Julian. Thank you all. This was amazing. What an amazing class today. And, uh, um, to be continued, to be continued next week. So, uh, really it's going to hard, it's going to be hard to kind of shift out of this class into Talmud, but we'll do our best. This is a fantastic group and a fantastic class. And thank you for all of your sharing. And, uh, for those of you who are joining for Talmud, we'll start now. Merci. Thank you.